Okay, so uh, today I'm going to talk about work that was done fairly recently with Mike Hesden. Uh, this is not a talk about dark energy, this is not a talk about strings, this is not a talk about inflation, this is not a talk about dark energy. This is a talk about the inverse square law. It's a talk about dark matter, and it's a talk about dwarf galaxies and the equivalence principle in gravity. So, the basic point of this talk is to show you that we now understand something about the interactions of dark matter particles from observations of astrophysical systems. I'm going to frame the discussion in the language of the equivalence principle. So let me start here. So the weak equivalence principle says that all masses are accelerated the same way in the gravitational field. So if I take any two objects and drop them, as Galileo showed at the Leon Tower, apocryphally, um, they fall the same way in the gravitational field. This is an important hypothesis or principle, uh, and it was promoted by Albert Einstein to something that he called the, uh, well, I don't know what he called it, the Einstein equivalence principle. So, according to Albert Einstein, the motion of freely falling particles in the same gravitational field uh, depends not only on their masses and their compositions, um, but it's also through, uh, sorry. The weak equivalence principle just says that all masses are solid the same in the gravitational field. This is an important underpinning of general relativity because general relativity is a metric theory of gravity, meaning that all masses are solid the same in the gravitational field. Um, Albert Einstein promoted this theory, he generalized it. Um, according to special relativity, E equals mc squared, so not only mass is all the same in the gravitational field, but also rest mass energy. The way he stated it is that the laws of physics are, all, are always the same in any freely falling frame. So this is a central underpinning of general relativity. It was tested by Galileo, Prince of presumably, the leading power of Pisa, and it's been tested since then. Um, Newton actually carried out some tests of the equivalence principle using pendula. Um, and then those experiments were improved in sensitivity over the subsequent uh, centuries. Uh, the real uh, breakthrough happened in the late 19th century by Roland von Eckbusch, who developed these Eckbusch experiments. I'm not going to describe those in detail, except I'll just tell you that uh, those types of experiments are still being carried out today, uh, for example, by the group at the, the University of Washington in Seattle. So current experiments achieve a sense of about 10 to the minus 13.5 precision. So these experiments, uh, they were developed in the modern uh, era by Dickey et al., by Kaczynski et al. in Moscow, and uh, currently, as I said, uh, continuing in Seattle. What they do is they determine that objects composed of different elements, different materials, fall the same way in a gravitational field for 1 part in 10 to the 13. Actually, it's more like 10, 1 part in 10 to the 13.5 now. So this is actually pretty remarkable when you think about it. Because if I look at two different elements, and I think about the atomic binding energy, the atomic binding energy of an atom is roughly 10 electron volts, the stress mass energy is roughly a GPP. So that's roughly one part in 10 to the eighth of the rest mass energy of a typical material is in the form of electromagnetic energy. And when you get to a sensitivity better than, say, one part in a billion, which these guys have done by several orders of magnitude, you're testing the equivalence of free fall not only of mass, but also of the rest mass energy associated with electromagnetic binding energy of an atom. So they've tested not only the weak equivalence principle, but also, in some sense, the Einstein equivalence principle, because they've shown the electromagnetic rest mass energy uh, falls the same way in the gravitational field. And the same can also be said about the strong interaction, which also constitutes some of the uh, rest mass energy of the nuclei. So we've tested not only the weak equivalence principle with these measurements, but also the Einstein equivalence principle. You can also ask about gravitational binding energy. So if you think about uh, somebody standing on the surface of the Earth, the escape velocity from the surface of the Earth is about 10 kilometers per second. The speed of light is 300,000 kilometers per second. So if I take 10 divided by 300,000, d squared divided by c squared, and square it, that's roughly one part in a billion. So what that means is that the gravitational binding energy is roughly one part in a billion per unit mass. If you look at the moon, though, the escape velocity from the surface of the moon is much smaller. 
And from that, we can infer that the gravitational binding energy for the unit mass of the moon is a lot smaller than that in the Earth. So one can ask whether the gravitational binding energy falls the same way in the gravitational field as ordinary matter. And one way to test that is by figuring out how whether the moon and the sun fall the same way in the gravity. Sorry, the moon and the earth fall the same way in the gravitational field of the sun. If gravitational binding energy is accelerating the same way as ordinary matter, then the moon and the sun will be the moon and the earth will be accelerating the same way in the gravitational field of the sun. So the binding energy for the unit mass of the moon is about 125th of that in the earth. And the earth spins around the sun. And the moon spins around the Earth to a first approximation, but both the moon and the Earth fall in the gravitational potential, gravitational potential of the sun, and therefore the Earth moon, the orbit of the moon around the Earth is actually affected by the gravitational field of the sun. And so, if the strong equivalence principle were violated, then the the uh, orbit of the Earth, uh, sorry, the moon around the Earth would be would be affected. And this is now tested by lunar laser ranging. We can determine the distance to the moon to roughly a few centimeters. And that has shown that the strong filling principle is in fact satisfied uh, to some precision. So not only electromagnetic rest mass energy, but also gravitational binding energy are uh, uh, all the same in the gravitational field. This is actually significant for alternative gravity theories. Um, so as far as, uh, well, actually, I'm not entirely sure. I've discussed it with the uh, some historians of science who actually worked at the Einstein Papers Project. It's still not clear to me whether Einstein understood <coughs> gravitational binding energy in general relativity falls the same way as uh, ordinary matter. It's true in general relativity, but it's not true in alternative gravity theories. In scalar tensor theories, gravitational binding energy does not fall the same way, does not accelerate the same way. And that is what uh, led Kenneth Nordbeck to think about this in the 60s. But anyway, the predictions of general relativity are that the strong equivalence principle is satisfied and they can test it with some precision. But most of the universe is not made of gravitational binding energy or baryons or electrons or electromagnetic binding energy. Most of the matter in the universe, or most of the mass in the universe is dark matter. And one can ask whether dark matter falls the same way in the gravitational field. So in principle, I can do a Galileo type experiment. I can go to the top of the Leaning Tower. I could take this laser pointer, for example, and I could take the neutralino and drop them in a gravitational field. There are only two problems, three problems. First of all, we don't know if the dark matter is a neutralino. Even if it was, it would be hard to actually take one and hold it there. And the third problem would be it would be hard to see it fall to the ground at the same time as the laser pointer. But in principle, you could do an experiment where you could take a dark matter particle, if you could actually capture one, drop it from a high building and see whether it hits the ground. At the, same, at the same time as uh, anything else. So, prior to our work, this was not a question that was addressed too much in the literature. There were a few papers by Freeman and Gradwell that I'll get to. There was an interesting paper by Chris Stubbs uh, in 1991. He did not address this, this uh, question directly, but he uh, addressed a related question. So, he asked whether the inverse square force, the gravitational force between a dark matter particle and a baryon, is the same as the gravitational force between two baryons. So everything that we've done in the solar system tests the gravitational force, g, m1, m2, divided by r squared, measured using Newton's constant, it's measured for the attraction between two baryons. So what he asked is, suppose we've got a dark matter particle and a baryon. According to gravity, they're going to attract each other, and there's going to be the, the gravitational constant is going to be Newton's constant. So what he did is he asked whether this Newton's constant is the same for dark matter baryon interactions as it is for baryon baryon gravitational interactions. And uh, I won't go into the details. It's actually a very clever idea. He used the Etwich type experiments to correlate the acceleration of masses, test masses in the laboratory, with the position of the center of the Milky Way. Since about 50% of the rotation curve locally in the Milky Way comes from dark matter, if the dark matter baryon interaction were different than the baryon baryon interaction, then these test masses in the laboratory would fall differently uh, depending on where the, the center of the galaxy is. And from that, he was able to infer that to a good approximation, dark matter baryons fall the same way. And, uh, dark matter baryons. The dark matter baryon force law is the same as the baryon baryon force law. 
But the question we want to ask is, does dark matter fall the same in a gravitational field? More precisely, according to general relativity, all masses are accelerated the same in a gravitational field. So the inverse square law should apply to, should describe the gravitational force between two particles, two dark matter particles. And according to general relativity, Newton's constant for that interaction should be the ordinary Newton's constant we measure in the laboratory. But we can ask whether this is true. Is it in fact true, experimentally or empirically, that the Newton's <coughs> constant for a dark matter, dark matter gravitational interaction, is that the same Newton's constant as the one that we measure in the lab? So if you think about it, there's really not much that we know about dark matter that would constrain or answer this question. So the usual dark matter probes that we have, for example, rotational curves and gra gravitational lensing, depend only on the distribution of dark matter in a galaxy or in a cluster of galaxies. So when we measure the rotation curve of the Milky Way, the only thing that rotation curve depends on is rho of r, the density as a function of radius. Likewise, when people do gravitational lensing, the deflection of light depends only on rho of r, the distribution of mass. It has nothing to do with how fast these particles are moving. If we were to change Newton's constant according to the Burial Theorem and hold the mass distribution, m and r, fixed, then the velocity dispersion of the dark matter particles would increase. Newton's constant is bigger. But we only measure m and r. We don't measure the velocities, and so we can't infer anything about the Newton's constant for dark matter. So it may be possible, or it could be possible, that Newton's constant for dark matter could be a lot bigger. It would mean only the dark matter particles were moving a lot more quickly in galactic halos, but since we don't see the particles, we don't know how fast they move, we would never know. So why is this an interesting question to ask? So first of all, curiosity. It's a fundamental prediction of general relativity that all particles fall the same in the gravitational field. Um, it's also a natural question to ask whether the dark matter, dark matter gravitational force law is the same as the force law depends on any of other particles. We've tested this force law for everything else in the universe. Why not test it for, for dark matter as well? The other thing, well, I there is, I guess, going to be some dark energy in here. Well, not dark energy. Uh, Ten years ago, we thought everything was uh, perfectly fine with gravity. We've now discovered that the acceleration, that the expansion of the universe is accelerating, and that is counter to the predictions of uh, ordinary gravity, unless there's some cosmological constant or something else going on. Um, I'm not going to really say what the dark energy is or what the origin of cosmic acceleration is, but I think the observations suggest we need to think about gravity a little more carefully than we did before, and so we should test all the fundamental predictions of gravity as well as the theory. Another motivation comes from the recent literature. There have been papers by Steve Gilser and Jim Peebles and Lennis Farr and Adi Nussler and a few others. And they suggest that a one over new, well, I guess the Steve Gilser part suggests that a new one of R squared force law uh, might be introduced for, for dark matter in string theories. So according to these papers, um, there are dark matter candidates that come from string theory in which the one over R squared force law between two dark matter particles is different than the one over R squared force law for baryons. Um, it has also been suggested in some of these papers that there are more voids in the universe than are predicted by lambda cold dark matter law. And the way they suggest to get around this problem is to postulate that the dark matter dark matter force law is twice as big as the baryon baryon force law. And if you do that, then you can evacuate the voids. Uh, in simulations. And uh, there are also deviations from the standard one of our squared force law that may occur, for example, in Newtonian theories. So, as a concrete example of one way in which you can get a, uh, an effective departure from uh, the one of our squared force law, the usual one of our squared force law, suppose there's some new scalar field phi. And suppose it couples to dark matter particle psi through a new hollow coupling with some coupling constant g. If this scalar field has a very low mass, then that will introduce a 1 over r potential. So if m sub phi is extremely small, then this exponential becomes 1, and the dark matter, dark matter 
uh, interaction or potential between these two particles just becomes minus p squared over 4 pi r. And what this does is it leads to another 1 over r squared force law in it between two dark matter particles in addition to gravity. So for all practical purposes, on astrophysical, small astrophysical scales, um, the Newton's constant for dark matter will be the ordinary Newton's constant times 1 plus beta squared, where beta is uh, a parameter of the, uh, of the quantity that parameterizes the magnitude of this new one of our square force law. So beta squared is actually going to be something that shows up in some of the subsequent diagrams. I want you to remember it. It's the departure. Beta squared is the fractional departure of the dark matter Newton's constant from the ordinary Newton's constant. So, how can we measure this dark matter Newton's constant? As I said, everything that we've seen so far in the universe is telling us that this dark matter comes from its, uh, its mass distribution only, and not from its, uh, its uh, force law. So, um, Friedman and Gravall wrote a few papers in the early 90s where they considered, for example, galaxy clusters. I won't go through the arguments because they're kind of complicated. They're sort of what you would guess. Um, the bottom line, though, is the galaxy clusters are very nasty astrophysical systems. Um, they're not clean probes of the dark matter distribution. Even though we have much better uh, uh, measurements now than we did 10 years ago or 15 years ago, they're still kind of nasty. And so there are effects that a Newton's constant, an altered Newton's constant for dark matter would have, but they can be easily um, altered or mimicked by standard astrophysical mechanisms. So, what we thought about is the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy, which at first might seem like an uncertain or uh, an unlikely place to look for new dark matter interactions, because the Sagittarius Dwarf is a, an interacting dwarf galaxy, and it's a nasty astrophysical system that lives in the halo of the Milky Way. But it turns out, for reasons that we didn't anticipate at first, that this turns out to be a very sensitive probe for dark matter dark matter interactions. So the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy is a dwarf galaxy that orbits in the galactic halo of the Milky Way. It is a dark matter dominated galaxy. The mass to light ratio is much larger than one. And so its orbit through the Milky Way halo is determined primarily by the dark matter dark matter interaction, because most of the Sagittarius Dwarf is dark matter, most of the Milky Way is dark matter. It turns out, though, that the Sagittarius Dwarf has from it tidal things that have been stripped. So I think I have a picture. So this is a, a picture of a simulation of the Sagittarius Dwarf that agrees quite well with the observations. So we uh, live over here. The galactic plane is over here. I'm sorry. The galactic plane is this dashed line over here. The galactic center is that point there. The sun is over here. And then if we look behind the galactic center, there's a, a, a Sagittarius, the Sagittarius Dwarf galaxy is over here. But what's observed is that many stars have been stripped from the Sagittarius Dwarf, and there's a trail of debris that's been stripped from the Sagittarius Dwarf that trails behind the, the Sagittarius Dwarf. And then there's also a trail, a, a trail of matter um, that runs ahead of the orbit of the Sagittarius Dwarf. So the Sagittarius Dwarf is moving along an orbit that's shown here that goes around like so. So there's matter that's been stripped behind the galaxy and matter that's been stripped ahead of the galaxy. The matter that's been stripped, though, are stars. So although the dark matter, the Sagittarius Dwarf itself, is dark matter dominated, the stripped stars act as baryonic tracers of the Milky Way's gravitational potential. So the stars, the orbits of the stars, should be determined by the dark matter baryon contraction, the interaction between the Milky Way's dark matter and the baryons and the stars. Whereas the Sagittarius Dwarf itself has an orbit determined by the dark matter. These streams, these stellar streams, are now long lived and very well observed with two mass and slow to no sky survey. And I'm always disappointed when I hear SDSS people talk and not mention this. This is one of the greatest things that's come out of this slow to no sky survey. There are thousands of stars in these tidal streams, both the leading and trailing tidal streams that have been observed. And we also have peculiar velocities for our. For, for, uh, for, no, not peculiar velocity. We've got radial velocities for uh, several thousands of these stars. <coughs> so the kinematics of the dwarf and its tail are very well measured. And the, the tidal streams are very long lived and they span, they go almost the entire way across the sky. 
And the other thing that's uh, nice about this system is that there have been detailed simulations that have been done by several groups, in particular uh, Law, Johnson, and Majewski, in which they've been able to simulate the Milky Way and the Sagittarius Dwarf, the orbit of the Sagittarius Dwarf around the Milky Way and the stars that have been stripped from the, from the, the dwarf. So the simulations now that we produce very well in Sagittarius Dwarf was observed as well as the leading and trailing trails of our observers. And from these simulations, you can infer the mass of light rays of the Sagittarius Dwarf and the orbital parameters, because if you change those parameters, you get different predictions that don't agree with the uh, observations. So to see how this system is going to constrain the dark matter, dark matter force law, we need to understand where the tidal tails come from. So here's a cartoon of the system. The Milky Way is at the center. The Sagittarius Dwarf is in orbit around the Milky Way. Its trajectory, we'll say, is going in this direct direction over here. The crucial point is that the Sagittarius Dwarf is not on a circular orbit. It's on a highly elongated orbit, elliptical orbit. And suppose, though, that at this point, it reaches the point of closest approach. So suppose this is a point of closest approach of the Sagittarius Dwarf. The Sagittarius Dwarf is being held together by its own self-gravity. So the stars remain in the Sagittarius Dwarf because of the gravitational attraction of all the other stars. But the Sagittarius Dwarf lives in the gravitational potential well due to the Milky Way. And suppose the Milky Way were simply a point mass. That would mean that there would be a 1 over r squared force law due to the Milky Way, which means that the acceleration of the stars on the inner part of the Sagittarius Dwarf towards the Milky Way would be larger than the acceleration of the stars on the outer part. If you think about it, my feet are accelerated towards the center of the Earth more strongly than my head is, and so there's actually a tidal force ripping me apart in the Earth's gravitational field. That's a very small effect, so don't worry about it too much. But the Sagittarius dwarf can actually be significant. So the Sagittarius dwarf is held together by its own self-gravity, but this tidal field due to the Milky Way tends to rip it apart. That tidal field is strongest when the Sagittarius dwarf reaches its point of closest approach. And when it reaches its point of closest approach, what happens is that, is that the stars from the inner part get stripped from the galaxy, and the stars from the outer part get stripped from the galaxy. The stars that are stripped from the inner part of the galaxy move along orbits in smaller galactocentric radii, where the velocities are slightly larger and the radius is slightly smaller. And so these particles, these stars that are stripped from the inner region, run ahead and form leading tail. Whereas the stars that are stripped from the outside are slightly larger galactocentric radii. They move at slightly smaller velocities, and so they trail behind. So when the galaxy is moved further on, and it's along its orbit, these stars will run ahead, and these stars will be trailing behind. And that's where these leading and trailing streams come from. So, just a few equations. The size of the satellite is determined by its tidal radius. So that is roughly the mass of the Sagittarius dwarf divided by the mass of the Milky Way to the one third <coughs> times r, which is the galactocentric radius of the Sagittarius dwarf. This so little r is the size of the Sagittarius dwarf, capital R is the distance from the sun of the Milky Way. The Milky Way mass is capital M. The mass of the Sagittarius dwarf is little m. <coughs> so that's the satellite size. Its orbital energy per unit mass is g times the mass of the Milky Way divided by r. And the energy of the tidally stripped matter is r d phi d r, where phi is the gravitational potential of the, uh, of the, of the uh, Milky Way. And so this is little m divided by capital M times to the one third of the orbital energy. And by doing up the simple, sorry, also the binding energy of the satellite is gm over little r, and this is little m divided by capital M over two thirds. So with these simple estimates, what you can infer is that the orbital energy of the Sagittarius dwarf is much bigger than its binding energy per unit mass. Sorry, much bigger than the tidal energy, and that's much bigger than the binding energy per unit mass. So this inequality tells you that the satellite has little influence on the tidal debris once it's been stripped, and so the tidal debris actually does move as three particles in the Milky Way scale up to a personal observation. And this inequality tells you that when the stars are stripped from the Sagittarius dwarf, 
When the stars are stripped of the Sagittarius dwarf, they don't receive a very large kick. The kick they receive in the radial direction is very small, and so they keep moving along the, the same trajectory as the, uh, the, the dwarf itself. So this inequality tells you the title of the brief follows roughly the same orbit as a satellite, and that's why you get these uh, very well uh, preserved streams. I'll skip those equations. So what we anticipated is that the streams would differ if the equivalence principle were violated from what it was with ordinary gravity. It turns out, though, that what we thought, so actually, and then what we did is try to address this with simulations. We thought this would be a complicated problem, which it is. And so we tried to address it with simulations. We used Gadget, which is a publicly available code due to Hulk and Springle. Uh, we simulated the disk bulge and halo of the Milky Way. Uh, we simulated the Sagittarius form. We set up initial conditions uh, properly. Um, we used 300,000 particles. Most of the particles were in the Sagittarius form itself. But we also had a number of particles in the, in the galaxy itself. And we ran the simulation on a cluster at CETA, which is where my test is now post -time. And these are the results of the simulation. There's the data. No, no. So here is the Sagittarius dwarf in its orbit around the Milky Way. The Milky Way are these black points in the middle. The core of the Sagittarius dwarf is over here. Um, this is about after 2.4 million years of uh, evolution. The blue points are dark matter particles, and the red points are stellar particles. And this is a simulation in which the equivalence principle is satisfied, which is why the red and blue particles um, are distributed in the same way. Here is a movie of the orbit. So this is the initial condition. The dwarf starts out over here. 0.3 giga years later, it's moved over here. 0.6 giga years later, it's over here. And the x here represents the core. And about a billion years after the start of the simulation, you already have significant tidal tail. And 2.4 billion years after the, after the start of the simulation, you've got these very long tail tidal tails that go all the way around the sky. Uh, so, what we did is we ran the simulation. We developed the simulation. We ran the simulation. Actually, Mike did all this. And we were able to reproduce the results of Law Johnson Majeski, i.e., we were able to get results that looked almost exactly like the, uh, the simulations that people developed to, to, to describe the system using the same parameters that they did. At that point, we decided to understood the simulation was well enough. And now what we did is we went into Gadget, we found a line in the code where it says force acting in this particle and this particle is one of our square times Newton's constant. And if those were two dark matter particles, we changed it. Multiply it by 1 plus beta squared. And what we thought is that it would be something complicated. What we found, though, was actually much more striking than what we had anticipated. So, this is the simulation I showed you before, in which the equivalence principle is satisfied. Here, beta is 0 0.1, meaning that we've increased the dark layer, dark layer force law by 1%. Here, beta is 0 0.2, and here, beta is 0 0.3. So over here, we've increased the dark matter, dark matter force law by 10%, only 10%. And what you see <laughs> is that this is very noticeably different than this. So when we increase the dark matter, dark matter force law by 10%, the stars are almost completely evacuated from the leading tail. As soon as we increase the dark matter, dark matter force law, even slightly, the stars, the bleeding tail, disappear almost entirely. Now, I'm not going to show you any detailed comparison of the data, but I'll tell you what the data look like. So a first very good approximation, there are an equal number of stars in the bleeding tail and in the trailing tail. And so we look at this, and we see that there are no stars in the bleeding tail. We conclude that this is inconsistent with the observations. So what's going on? is fairly easy to understand in retrospect, although we did not necessarily anticipate this. So, this is the diagram I showed you before. Now, let's consider the case, what happens if the dark matter, dark matter force law is increased. So this little green blob over here is supposed to represent the stellar distribution. If the dark matter, dark matter force law is increased, that means the dark matter, which is this white blob over here, 
in the Sagittarius Dwarf was accelerating more strongly towards the galactic center than are the stars. What that means is that the stars are accelerated relative to the center of the relative to the dark matter in the Sagittarius Dwarf. So it's as, it's as if I had a bowl of water and I were to pull the bowl of water across the table. As I accelerate the bowl of water, the water would uh, slosh to the back. Likewise here, if the dark matter is accelerated towards the galactic center more strongly than the stars, the stars slosh to the back of the Sagittarius dwarf. And what that means is that when the Sagittarius dwarf reaches its point of closest approach, the matter that's stripped from the leading tail is dark matter only, and the stars only stream out the back side. So if it was the stars that get stripped from the inside that gave rise to the leading tail, or if the stars are now displaced to larger galactocentric radii, they stream only out, only out the back, and they give rise only to a trailing tail, and there is no leading tail. So that describes what's going on here, and from the simulations, which are more quantitative than that argument, we infer that by the time Newton's constant is increased by even 10%, um, it's rolled out. So, um, I have a bunch of slides here that I'm not going to describe in detail, but I'll just tell you what we did and why there's so many of them. So the obvious question you can ask is, can this effect be mimicked by any of the astrophysical parameters that we determined from the observations? In other words, can I change the leading to trailing ratio by changing the mass to light ratio of the Sagittarius four, or the distribution of stars within the Sagittarius four, or the eccentricity of Sagittarius four's orbit, uh, its orbital parameters, or the Milky Way's mass distribution? And what Mike did is rerun the simulations, changing each of these parameters. And changing each of these parameters changes the details of the, of the orbit of the Sagittarius four and its tails, but none of them actually changes the leading to trailing ratio of the insignificant effect. And so we conclude from this that it's highly unlikely that traditional astrophysics would mimic or change the leading to trailing ratio. And from this we conclude from the observations that the dark matter, dark matter force law has to be less than 10%. It can be no greater than 10% different than the bearing of the force law. We also anticipate that with future measurements, actually not future measurements, so we're not the data analysts, um, but what we did until now, the only analysis, analysis we did by, from, until now is just a by eye analysis. And comparing by eye tells us that once you increase the human test by 10%, it builds up. But there are very sensitive, there are very detailed and precise measurements of the Sagittarius Dwarf's tail, including the positions of thousands of stars and the radial velocities of thousands of stars. And the simulations predict not only the positions, but also the radial velocities of the stars. And we believe that by doing a detailed comparison of the simulations with the data, we should be able to probe a Newton's constant that differs from an ordinary Newton's constant um, to within about a percent. So we estimate we can do about a factor of 10 better with more detailed analysis, which we have not yet done. So uh, that's basically the end of the story there. Um, I think it's interesting the Sagittarius Dwarf is not necessarily a clean astrophysical system, but it turns out in this particular case you can actually infer that dark matter falls the same way in gravitation for that potential while the ordinary matter perhaps to the future.
So it's not an assumption. That's all we're, we're, we're just testing whether a dark matter, the dark matter, dark matter force law is the same as the, the variant, variant force law. So it's uh, yes, it is an assumption. <coughs> 